Do you have trouble spotting liver lobules? Can you tell a sinusoid from a bile duct? Do you ever wonder if you'll ever see a hepatocyte with two nuclei? Well, let's see if we can sort these things out for you. If you want to follow along, there are digital versions of the slides on the website and a link can be found in the description. The liver is one of the largest organs in the body of most animals. It's essential for a whole host of important things from storing glucose as glycogen to converting ammonia to urea. If your liver's not working properly, it'll really ruin your day. So what does it look like under the microscope? Well, it's beautiful. I think it's one of my favourite organs. It's got a nice geometric pattern to it at low power, and when you zoom in, you can see all the happy hepatocytes with their nuclei like big googly eyes. To understand the structure of the liver, first it's important to understand its blood supply. The liver has two large vessels entering it. The hepatic artery, which receives about 25% of the oxygenated blood output by the heart, and the hepatic portal vein that carries blood from the intestines. You might expect most of the oxygen supply to the liver to be provided by the hepatic artery. In fact, it's about a 50-50 split between the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein. This is because the hepatic portal vein supplies about 70-80% to of the liver's blood supply. As well as oxygen, the blood in the hepatic portal vein is laden with whatever the intestines decided to absorb or let through the epithelium. That could be nice things like nutrients or naughty things like toxins or bacteria. Nice or naughty, the liver has ways to deal with whatever comes its way until it doesn't and then you get life-threatening abscesses or the hepatocytes just die and leave you to deal with the consequences. We can see branches of these two blood vessels in the liver quite easily. They're both located in a structure called the portal triad. You can spot some large portal triads at low power quite easily. They're large, tend to have a bit of connective tissue around them with blood vessels in transverse section. If we zoom in on one, we can identify an artery and a vein. The branches of the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein respectively. The other member of the triad is the bile duct, differentiated from the other structures by its handsome columnar epithelium. There are also lymphatic vessels in the triad, but apparently they're not important enough to make this a hepatic quartet. We'll come back to the bile ducts later. Blood from the hepatic artery and portal vein leaves the portal areas and enter the sinusoids, which we can see as these gaps between cords of hepatocytes. Sinusoids are essentially capillaries, but they are lined by specialised endothelial cells which are fenestrated. This means that they have 100 nanometer diameter sieve-like pores which allow fluid and particulate exchange between the blood and the perisinusoidal space. That's the space around the sinusoid. The nuclei of the endothelial cells look similar to those of blood vessels elsewhere, elongated, thin and condensed like this one, or this one, or this one. A second type of cell is also present lining the sinusoids. These are Kupfer cells, a resident macrophage of the liver. They're there to deal with any bacteria or other particulate matter that enters the liver from the portal blood. They're quite difficult to spot, but they are different from the endothelial cells. Being macrophages, they have rounder nuclei and a bit more cytoplasm. They tend to protrude into the sinusoid lumen a bit more. They're much easier to spot if they've been eating things, so sometimes during pathologic conditions, they might be a bit more prominent. These nuclei here probably belong to Kupfer cells. I've been very selective with the examples because it's often very difficult to tell what a cell is without special stains or other clues. Separating the sinusoids from the hepatocytes is an extracellular space called the space of dis, which contains reticulin fibres and nerves. The liver doesn't have much connective tissue, so these reticulin fibres and other connective tissues are all that's holding the liver cells together. This makes the liver extremely sensitive to trauma and a liver rupture can be seriously bad news, producing a large amount of hemorrhage. What little connective tissue there is is produced by the hepatic stellate cells, which sit just below the space of dis. These cells have two functions, to produce extracellular matrix or collagen and to store vitamin A. This latter function means they're often filled with fat, which makes them easier to identify. In this section of liver from a cat, you can see lots of round, clear spaces. If you look closely, some of these have a squashed peripheral nucleus. These are hepatic stellate cells filled with fat, sometimes called itto cells. Just below the space of dis are the hepatocytes, the cells that form the bulk of the liver and perform all the metabolic magic of liver tissue. 
Hepatocytes are the easiest cells in the liver to identify. If you threw a microscopic dart at a liver, you'd probably hit a hepatocyte. They're big with plenty of cytoplasm and a large, beautiful round nucleus. The nucleus usually contains a prominent nucleolus. The nucleolus is a collection of RNA, DNA and protein and is the site of ribosome synthesis. So it makes sense that a metabolically active cell like a hepatocyte that needs a lot of proteins would also be churning out lots of ribosomes. It's not unusual to find binucleate hepatocytes. This is allowed and normal with up to 10% of hepatocytes containing two nuclei. What isn't allowed is the hepatocytes with really big nuclei, like this one here. This breaks all kinds of rules and is definitely abnormal. Usually hepatocytes have quite homogeneous eosinophilic cytoplasm, but they can sometimes get feathery or vacuolated cytoplasm as well as accumulate pigments. For example, in this section of liver, the hepatocytes are filled with yellow-brown granules. This could be bile, or more likely in this case, represents lipofusion, a wear and tear pigment that accumulates in cells of older animals. This makes sense in this case as the sample was taken from an elderly cat. In fact, this bit of liver came from my own cat, who very sadly had to be put to sleep around six months ago. So here she is, helping to teach and educate people about liver histology. Thanks, Florence. She actually had a bit of a weird nodule on her liver. It was one of a few things I found at her autopsy. I've been considering making a little video series about Florence's autopsy and the gross and histologic findings from it, but I don't know if it's a little too odd. Uh, let me know in the comments. Anyway, back to the liver. While all the hepatocytes look quite similar, they can be divided into three zones, depending on their distance from the portal tracts. Those closest to the portal tracts are the periportal hepatocytes. Those closest to the central vein are the centrolobular hepatocytes, and those in the middle are the mid-zonal hepatocytes. Functionally, these zones can produce different enzymes and deal with different aspects of metabolism. Knowing the different hepatocyte zones can help us localise injuries and give us clues about what caused them. For example, toxins that arrive from the gastrointestinal tract will be at their highest concentration in the portal blood, and the periportal hepatocytes will take the brunt of the injury. The opposite is true for hypoxic injury, when there isn't enough oxygen in the blood to supply all the hepatocytes. Oxygen levels will be at their highest in the periportal areas, but all the available oxygen will be consumed by the time the blood reaches the centrolobular hepatocytes. This section of liver from a sheep shows a typical centrolobular pattern of injury consistent with hypoxic injury. The periportal and midzonal hepatocytes are fine, but the centrolobular ones have begun to degenerate and die, disrupting the sinusoids and causing areas of hemorrhage. This is particularly visible at low power if we zoom out, we can see lots of different areas of hemorrhage dotted around, and if you look carefully you'll notice that these are confined to the centrolobular areas. The sample was taken from the same sheep that featured in the lung histology video, and had valvular endocarditis resulting in congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, and inadequate oxygen supply to its tissues. The last thing that needs to be talked about is the biliary system. Hepatocytes produce bile which is composed of water, bile salts, bilirubin, a breakdown product of haemoglobin, and fats like cholesterol. Between hepatocytes there are small gaps between the cell membranes called bile canaliculi. Bile is secreted into these canaliculi which channel the liquid towards the canals of herring. Neither of these structures is visible normally, they're too small. They'll only become visible if there's some kind of obstruction to normal bile drainage, which makes them distend as the hepatocytes continue pumping bile into them. Canals of herring direct the bile to bile ducts in the portal areas, which flow into larger and larger bile ducts until they reach the gallbladder, where bile is stored. We can see bile ducts in portal triads. They're lined by columnar epithelium with nice basal nuclei differentiating them nicely from the artery and vein. Generally the lumen is empty but can be filled with some eosinophilic material, uh, but there's no blood. Quite often in larger portal areas you'll get smaller bile ducts that have sprouted. So that's a quick whiz through the histology of the liver. If you're still watching at this point, well done. Perhaps you found this video helpful and would consider subscribing or giving this video a like. If you want some more content on normal histology, you can check out this video on eye histology, or head over to the channel page where there should be a series on normal histology of a wide variety of other animals and organs. 
Thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.